call upon your name, God, that you alone are strong enough to save, God. I pray for us this evening as your word is spoken, Lord, that our ears would be open to hear what you have for us, God, that our distractions would be washed away, and we would focus on you and you alone. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Benjamin. Hey, I just want to point something out. Uh, Benjamin was on keys tonight. Uh, that might not mean anything to you, but homie's been practicing and going to classes so that he could learn. Uh, and he killed it. Great job, Benjamin. Good job. Good job. Well, hey, uh, last week we kicked off our new series titled The Devil Wears. And in case you are new or you just couldn't make it last week, let me give you some context as to what the heart of this series is focused on, what the, the purpose of the series is. We learned at the end of our last series when we walked through the book of Ephesians, at the very end in chapter 6, we learned that we, as followers of Christ, we have enemies. Um, in fact, in Ephesians 6, verse 12, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over their present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And, and last week we looked at that at the very beginning and we, we learned that the Greek word wrestle used in that text actually implies hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so it's this idea that, that we're being told and warned that we have a real enemy uh, who is in charge of others that are against us, who uh, want to pin us down by the throat. We have a real enemy. And so the reality that you and I as followers of Christ uh, need to come to terms with, that we need to know is every morning we wake up and we set our feet on our bedroom floor, we are actually stepping into a war. And, and so this is where the heart of this series comes. My hope is that, that the things that we learn in this series would help us wrestle well, that you uh, would, would take the things that we learn in God's word, that we would come to his word and we would allow it to inform us uh, of our enemy. You know, the beautiful thing about God's word is, is it not only it reveals God's character to us, but God also is so rich in his mercy and grace that he gave us his word that includes our enemy's playbook. And so you and I get to see what the enemy's playbook is. And so my prayer throughout this series is that you and I, we would, we would come to a place where we would embody the words written in 1 Peter 5.8. That we would be more alert and sober-minded because of the knowledge that we know we have an enemy, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking to devour us. We have an enemy who wants to wreak havoc in our life and in our relationship with our Savior. And so if you were not here, let me just catch you up on what we did last week. Last week, we, we learned that our, our chief enemy is the devil, the, the deceiver. In fact, in John, we learned that he's, he's called the father of lies. And so we went to Genesis 3. That's the very beginning of uh, the Bible, the first book, and it's the very first time and first place that we get introduced to our enemy, Satan. And what we did is, is I told you that we would walk through the fall, through Genesis 3, and we were going to allow Scripture to discern three lies that Satan would have you and I believe. And I told you that these, these lies he used at the very beginning of man, and he still uses them today. And the first lie, the, the only lie that we addressed last week was the lie that God is really not that good. 
Satan wants you to believe that God is really not that good, that he's not really worth giving up everything for, that he's not really wanting you to experience the fullness of joy, but that he's withholding from you. That's the lie that Satan would have you and I believe. That's what we covered last week. This week, we're going to jump right into it. I don't have a a fun story about me and my cousins, Billy and Josh, this week. Uh, We're going to jump right into it. And so I'm going to reread for you all Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7. I would ask that you would stand as we read, uh, as we do at this church, uh, because we believe that God's word is given to us so that we can know his ways and carry them out in a glorifying way. And so would you stand as I read this text? Now, the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat of it or you will die. No. You will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman, verse 6 says, saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is the word of the Lord. The second lie, if you're taking notes, the second lie that Satan would have you believe is that you don't need God because you can be God. Satan would have you and me believe that you don't need God because you can be God. And listen, I, I know, let me just say before we get into the text of where this is at and, and how this applies to our life, let me just say, I know, no one in this room walks around like, hey bro, you know what God I worship? I worship myself. Like, none of us are doing that. Let me just preface. I know that none of us are doing that. But I want you to tune in and check out how this plays out with Adam and Eve. Before we get into the text, uh, let me just ask all of us to agree on the fact and the truth that up to this point, everything Adam and Eve had was a gift from God. Do we agree on that? Like the breath in Adam and Eve's lungs was literally breathed in by God himself, a gift, okay? Adam and Eve's wedding was officiated by none other than God himself. None of us can say that. It was a gift. God gifted them with authority over all creation. God's presence in their life was a gift. Do you realize Adam and Eve didn't have to walk by faith? They got to walk by sight. It was a gift. God gifted them with paradise and every good fruit you could imagine. It was a gift. Their entire existence to this point was a gift from God. Do we all agree on that? Okay. And then... The enemy shows up, and what does he do? To paraphrase, he says, Adam, Eve, let's be clear. You don't actually need God. Take this fruit, and you can be God. Like, look at at verse 5 for Uh, Sorry, look at uh, at right here, verse 5. For God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like 
God. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delightful to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took up its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. I want to draw your attention to the, the first sentence in verse six of the woman's response. The first sentence, it says, when the woman saw that it was good. I think that's really significant because we see up until this point, God was the one who was defining what was good. In fact, six different times throughout creation, God creates, he steps back, he looks at it and he says, this is good. But here we see for the first time, Eve is deciding what is good. And it's so interesting, uh, it, it goes on to say that she, she took it and ate it. She then gives it to her husband and, and he eats it. When I was studying this, I discovered in a commentary that the, the Hebrew word for took, she took it, uh, is the same word that God used, or, or that is used when God took Adam and placed him in the garden. It's the same word used when, when God took a rib out of Adam to fashion Eve. And so what, do, what is the significance behind this? I think it's, it's this idea that what we see is Eve is now taking as though she was God when he took. It goes on to say the result was... Then their eyes were both opened, and they knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. You see, up until this point, we, we established that God had provided everything for Adam and Eve. And now, Adam and Eve are trying to provide for themselves. You see, Adam and Eve have bought into the lie that they don't need God because they can be God. And I just wonder, I want to ask the same question I asked last week to you guys. I want you to ask yourself, where in my life right now does this lie hold weight? Where does this lie hold hold truth in my life right now? Like how does, how does this lie that you don't need God because you get to be God take shape in your life right now? Maybe it looks something like this. I don't know, maybe, maybe I, I wonder if anyone in this room would say, I'm just too busy for Jesus. Like I'm just, I'm too busy to read the Bible. Here's the thing, I started that with I wonder, but I don't wonder, I know, because I've sat in small groups with you, and oftentimes what we confess is, I just get too busy. And, and, and so it, it, it looks something like this, like, like I have this graduation party and I have to prepare for, and I have this after school event going on, and and I, I, I have plans with these groups of friends because I'm not going to see them during the summer. And, and, and then I have to get a summer job and I have all these summer camps. And, and the honest truth is I just don't have time to get in God's word. I just don't have time for Jesus. Do you understand what's happening in your life when that's occurring? Like, let me... Be really clear. Why are you too busy for Jesus? Here's the answer. You're too busy to be with Jesus because you're too busy trying to be Jesus. You're too busy for God because you're too busy trying to be God. And, that, and that, that sounds really harsh. And, and let me just tell you, that's not our intention. I fall into this too. 
I get so caught up in the things I need to do for my job that is serving at a church in in a position that is is supposed to be seen as a spiritual leader. And sometimes I get so busy with those things, I don't make time to be with God. And so let me just tell you, I'm not trying to step on anyone's toes. This is a, a, a thing that is very real for me. The truth of the matter is in those moments, myself and you, we're too busy for God because we're just trying to be God. And, and when that happens for some of you, like Jesus no longer becomes a source of life, but Jesus, Jesus just becomes a source of obligation in the midst of your busyness. I wonder if anyone in the room tonight would, would confess to living in what feels like just a perpetual state of stress. Like, like just all the time stressed. Like it, it's the undercurrent in which your life is on. It's, it's uh, this anthem that you walk to and, and you almost wear it as a badge of honor. And so conversations come up like, man, how are you doing? And it's like, man, I, I'm just so stressed. And that's the conversation every time, every Wednesday, it's just, man, I'm so stressed. Man, I'm so stressed. And here's the thing, I, 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 I pause and wanna ask the question why, and I can't help but come to the conclusion that it's because we were too busy trying to control things that only God has control of. And so in essence, we're trying to be God. And then I, I wonder if, if any of us here tonight, if we are just doing in our life whatever feels right at all times. Like, I, I just wonder if, if you are living the same words that Solomon says when he says, I've never said no to myself. And so, man, if... If you don't want to do homework, you don't do homework. And if, if you don't want to do what your parents tell you to do, you just don't. If you feel like vaping, you vape. If you want to have uh, things that are outside the boundaries of what your relationship with your girlfriend or boyfriend should, you do it. Man, if you... If you want to watch porn, you watch it. You just do what you want to do whenever you want to do it, however you want to do it. And then when, when you live like that, you may not be saying with your words, I don't need God, but you're saying with your actions, I have authority over my life, not you. I'm the one that chooses what I can and can't do. I'm the one that chooses what's best for me. And so we just, we get into this place where we, we, we refuse to submit to the authority of you, God, because my life is under my authority. And then you know what's crazy? Is when we, when we start grasping for the authority in our own life. You know what we, what we act like? We act like spiritual teenagers. And listen, I know that this room is filled with teenagers. And so just hear me sincerely, hear my heart. Let me soften my tone. I'm not trying to slap you in the face right now. I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm trying to slap all of us in the face because all of us are guilty of this. We get to this place where, where we, we act like spiritual teenagers. That, let, me, let me tell you an example to maybe help bring this to our minds the right way. Man, I have two two-year-olds at home, Harbor and Ivory. Harbor and Ivory can't imagine a life without being desperately dependent on mom and dad. Like when they're hungry, 
They don't go cook their own meal. When Harbor and Ivory are hungry, what do they do? They cry and whine and fuss and get upset and try to get mom and dad to feed them. They wait on mom and dad to feed them. When Harbor and Ivory get hurt, they want mom and dad to scoop them up and make it okay. Harbor and Ivory do not know an existence at this moment in their life where they can do anything on their own. But let's be really clear. And I have to remind myself this all the time. There will come a day, Lord willing, that those two are going to be teenagers. And the thing with teenagers is teenagers just want control and independence. Like that's what teenagers want. It's like, man, I, I wish my mom and dad would just leave me alone. Stop telling me what to do. I'm old enough to make my own decisions. But but mom, dad, I do want that dinner that you put on the table every night for me. But just know I'm in control. Like when I get in my car that you pay for, that you pay for the insurance, when I get in that car, I'm in control. But please, uh, just don't forget to put a little extra money in my account this week because I have that event with my friends. But I'm in control. I'm independent. I got this. Don't tell me what to do, but hey, I did get in a fender bender and I think that's going to come on your bill, not mine. But I'm in control. That's crazy, right? Like that's the exact same thing that we do when we, when we buy into this lie that we can be God. And so it, it starts to look like this. You know what, God? I can do this by myself. I'm the one in control. I don't need you, but... Hey, big fella upstairs, please keep putting breath in my lungs. Hey, God, I, I'm a little too busy for you right now. I know I haven't talked to you and, and since last Falls Creek, uh, but I've just been really busy pursuing my dreams and my things that, that I'm gifted in and that I want to do. Uh, and, and I don't know if you've noticed, but I am pretty gifted. Uh, and so I need to cultivate that to be able to do what I need to do. Uh, but hey, just please make sure, God, that the brain that you gave me, the gifted talents that you gave me, don't go away. Can I just share with you? I was sitting in my office yesterday morning. Oh, man. Yeah, you know, emotional. I was sitting in my office yesterday morning working on this lesson. And I was just struck by such a heavy reality. And the reality is this, I am drowning every day in the grace and mercy of God. You are drowning every day in the grace and mercy of God. In fact, can, I, can we all just do a, like a two second exercise? For, for just a second, will everyone on the count of three take a deep breath, one, two, three. I want us to be really clear. You were able to do that because of God's grace and mercy. You're welcome. The second lie Satan would have you and I believe is that we don't need God because we can be God. The third and final lie that we see in this text is this. There are no consequences. Satan would have you believe that there are no consequences to disobedience to God. What did the devil say to Eve in verse 4? You will not surely die. God said you would die? You will not surely die? There are no consequences for disobeying God. In fact, the devil promises pleasures and good things and blessings. But we can, we can read the rest of this story and we get to see with our own eyes that he is in fact a liar. There's absolutely consequences to the disobedience of Eve and Adam. We know that 
that there are many consequences to disobeying God. In this text, it breaks down several. God tells them what the consequences are going to be. And instead of going through every one of them, let me just summarize what I think is a fully encompassing consequence. I think all of the consequences that are laid out in Genesis 3 all encompass this, a loss of peace. Think about it. First, they lose peace with themselves. Like up until this point, they are naked and unashamed. In chapter two, before this text, it says that they were naked and unashamed. They were fully known, fully seen, and fully loved. They eat the fruit. And what's the first thing they do, man? They try to clothe themselves and, and hide themselves. Like, let's be really clear. It was at that moment that insecurity and guilt and shame entered humanity. They lost peace with themselves. They also lose peace with each other. Like, same thing. They were in this, this beautiful communion of, of marriage together where they were, again, fully seen and fully known. And, and the second they eat that fruit, they recognize that, that there's something wrong with themselves and, and, and that there are things about them that, that are less, less favorable than other things. And so what do they do? They try to cover it up so the other doesn't see. And then there's a loss of peace with them and God. Man, 3.8 says this, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden on a cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of Lord God among the trees of the garden. What's so interesting about this that I never knew is that the Hebrew word uh, for, uh, for walking that's said right here, that they, they heard God walking in the garden. The Hebrew word was an idiom that meant friendship and relationship. And so let me reread it in that terms. What it's saying is, is that God was walking in the garden. God was seeking a friendship and relationship in the garden. And what do Adam and Eve do? They hide. The relationship was broken and would never be the same. Listen to me. There is absolutely always consequence to sin. And this isn't something new that you're hearing from this stage. Like we have learned this. We have covered this in, in, our, in our series, Good to Godly, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we, we saw how Adam, or, or David, excuse me, was, was breaking commands, that he was being disobedient to God, but in those moments, he wasn't seeing any consequences, he was seeing blessing. But there still was this ultimate consequence, and that was the death of a man named Uzzah. Sin always has consequences. And, and listen to me, look at me, everyone. I hope that this, what I'm about to say, isn't news to you. What happens in your teenage years doesn't just stay in your teenage years. Like, take it from someone who has experienced guilt and shame from previous decisions in this teenage years. They don't stay there. They follow you into adulthood. There is always consequence to your sin. But what the evil one wants you to do is he wants you to only see the front side of sin. Like he only wants you to see the short-term gratification. He never wants to see you peek around the corner and see the long-term guilt and shame that will last this side of eternity. I mean, some of us are in this room and we are, we are currently living in some consequence of our sin right now. 
These are the three lies that the devil, your enemy, my enemy, would have you believe. That one, God is really not that good. Two, you do not need God because you can be God. And three, there are no consequences. But can, I just, can I just tell you something that I love about Genesis chapter three? Man, in the same book, in the same chapter, that we are introduced to disobedience, the same chapter that we are introduced to the consequences of sin, the same chapter that we are introduced to our enemy, we are also introduced to a promise of a Savior. Let me read verse 15 to you. It says, I, this is God speaking to both the, the Adam and Eve and the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. I learned that this is this this verse right here, 315, is, is known as Provo Evangelium. And, and what that means is, is it is the first gospel. And so right here, this is, is a first glimpse of the good news of Jesus Christ. And what God is saying is, is even after Adam and Eve's rebellion to God, he's quick to step in with mercy and love. And he promises that, that there will be somebody who will come and he will do what you and I cannot do. And he will defeat the snake. He will defeat Satan. And what he says is, is, is the way it's going to work is, is the snake is actually going to bruise the heel. And I don't know about you, but if you think about a poisonous snake and biting you on the heel, man, that's a, that's a fatal blow. And the truth is, it was a fatal blow. Like Satan took uh, uh, Judas and, and he used Judas and he used the Pharisees to arrest Jesus, and then he used the Roman soldiers to crucify Jesus, and it was fatal. He died. And he entered that tomb, and then three days later, he resurrected, and he smashed the serpent on the head. And in doing so, he defeated sin, Satan, and death once and for all. And so I just want to encourage you tonight, look at me. If you are struggling with one of these three lies, I just want to encourage you to look to the cross. Man, if you're struggling with whether or not God is really that good, look to the cross. God is so good that he desired you despite your rebellion and he died for you on the cross. And as Brennan and Benjamin come up, if you're struggling with this idea of serving God or being your own God. Man, let me speak to you real quick. Man, Philippians 2 says this, that there is coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ Jesus is Lord. And so here's the truth to you who is struggling with whether or not to serve God or to be your own God. There will come a day for you where you will absolutely be faced with the truth and reality that God is the only God. And you can either come to terms with that now and you can experience this side of eternity, the joys of serving him. Or you can wait until judgment day, but it doesn't matter. You will face the truth that there's only one God and it's Jesus Christ. And finally, if you are, if you are struggling with the idea that there are no consequences to your sin, maybe you don't see the consequences. Maybe you don't even feel convicted anymore in a sin that you've been struck with for so long. Let me just tell you to look at the cross. Man, Jesus has nails pinned into his wrists and feet. There were absolutely consequences for your sin. Someone died out of a consequence for your sin. 
And if Satan is the, the father of lies, then you need to get attached and connected with the embodiment of truth. And that is Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And so here's what I think might need to happen tonight. I'm going to be real honest with you. I went back and forth on, on whether or not to say this. I just sense that there is a lot of faithful students in this room who have gotten to a place over the course of the last year where they've bought into one of these lies. And you're absolutely a follower of Christ, but you are absolutely not in good standing with your Heavenly Father. Your salvation is sealed. Don't get me confused on that. But, but you have not been abiding in the Lord. You have, you have this feeling where you, you, you know that you haven't spoken to him. You know that you haven't been in his word. And this just feels like a heavy lesson. Listen to me. If that's you, don't wait for False Creek to respond. Why? God wants communion with you tonight. So in this response song, man, if that's you, find a leader who you know and trust and go say, I just want to, I just need to walk through a prayer of repentance. I know that that's what I need. I don't really know how to do it. Will you pray with me? And if you're in this room and you, you don't have a genuine relationship with Christ, he's not your Lord and Savior. You have that opportunity tonight. Don't wait. Do the same thing. Grab a leader and say, man, I want a relationship with Christ. I want him to be God, not me. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, God, you are so good to us. Holy Spirit, would you move in this place? Would we be sensitive to your leading? Lord, we know that you are good. We know that you are God. And we are grateful that you took the consequence of our sin. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please stay with me and sing these words.